everyone welcome in this afternoon i am so excited you guys are here i'm excited to be here today we have such a really cool show today i have my friend dennis carroll backstage we're going to be talking about the bloodthirsty creatures of the night okay and uh and it's going to go from vampires to werewolves uh, so maybe a little voodoo, a little black magic and everything in between today. So you guys, please get your popcorn and come back and join us. Even if you're sitting at your desk, okay, go pop some popcorn in that office microwave. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we're going to, um, we're going to have a lot of fun. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dennis today. All right. He has over 40 years experience in the field of the paranormal. He studied, researched and investigated many aspects pertaining to the paranormal and the supernatural. Dennis is a well-known authority on folklore, legends, superstitions, cryptozoology, and the occult. He's a supernaturalist and paranormal consultant who's advised people throughout the world, and he's a published author and speaker and performs lectures and presentations on culture, folklore, myths, and legends. You can find him on the Nighthawk High Strangeness podcast on YouTube every Saturday and Sunday morning. That's my favorite way to wake up in the morning on the weekend. So I'd like to introduce to my show, Mr. Dennis Carroll today. Hey, Dennis. Uh, good evening. Uh, well, evening or early evening. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> or good, good morning to some people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, hey, I've got my vampire spike with me just in case. Ooh. Okay. Okay. I'll watch your six. <laughs> if, if something comes up from behind you, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, this is going to be a lot of fun. Get the crosses and the and the holy water out. Yes. <laughs> nice. Yes, we we need to. We're we're here. We're prepared today. We're prepared to talk about vampires. Now, there's mm -hmm. vampires and werewolves. You know, those are two oh, of the yeah. main creatures of the night. You know, I, I've done a whole lot of research at this point on werewolves and dogman. You know, well, there's um, a. Uh... An interesting connection between werewolves and vampires, Jessica. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, in uh, in Hollywood, the vampire can turn into a wolf. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, like Dracula, the original Dracula and all that. Uh, he uh, not only turns into a bat, but a wolf as well. As a matter of fact, if you go back in folklore and look, uh, there is a uh, distinct difference uh, in, in Hollywood and the original folklore, Hollywood is, I, I tell people a lot of times, we have to put Hollywood aside when you're talking about the real subject of vampires and werewolves and such, because if they have built a, their own sort of patina of, of a legend around these things that can throw you off sometimes. But the original vampire actually is um, considered more prevalent with wolves than turning into bats. Um, why, how it's the bat true. thing got started is kind of interesting, but uh, you do have the vampire bat, you know, mm -hmm. the vampire bat in South America, and I think that's where that Hollywood made that connection a lot with it. But the real vampire is much more deadly, much more, shall we say, nefarious than uh, the mm -hmm. actual ones you see in Hollywood. Uh, Hollywood sort of made a, a sort of a sex symbol of the vampire. <laughs> oh, so romantic, right? Romantic. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. You, be a, one. you want a va vampire? Yeah. I want a vampire boyfriend. I tell you what, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I'd rather go for yeah, the werewolves. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I like uh, my own personal favorite, the werewolf. The vampire is okay, but I uh, mean, you know, look at the werewolf. He's sort of the werewolf is sort of a force of nature. Yeah. Uh, more so than a vampire, uh, although they can be dispatched in basically the same way as, of course, supposedly with a silver bullet. But the silver bullet, I think, is a little more Hollywood, too, for the vampire than it is for the werewolf. Uh, when it comes to the dispatching a werewolf, anything silver supposedly will do the trick. 
and why silver now? Why did I ask you people and and you you uh, you deal a lot in jewelry? Uh, silver, silver is considered a basic holy metal because it comes out of the ground in a more pure form. Gold the same way. Gold and silver. You can give me as much as you want to give me of that. I'll take it. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll take it too. Silver and gold are supposed to be basically holy metals. And, of course, the best bullet is made out of silver and not gold, by the way. Mm-hmm. Although I have heard of golden bullets. It's but the silver is, is, yeah, <laughs> so more of a nature blessed type of a uh, thing, you know, yeah. in that respect. And that's it. But, you know, um, people over the years have dispatched vampires in many ways, like this, uh, the metal spike I showed you earlier. Uh, there have been graves open with these metal spikes sticking in, not just through the heart of these corpses, but through the mouth and all that, holding these people down. That was the main thing, was holding them and keeping them to their graves. Mm. So the aspect of the vampire and the werewolf, the two very different things. The werewolf is considered more physical and natural, sort of unnatural, natural. Whereas in the vampire, it's considered somewhat more spiritual. You know, mm-hmm. He inhabits the bodies of the dead. He feeds off of the living. But, uh, and there's Hollywood again. The feeding process of the vampire is really more spiritual than actual blood. Uh, although blood's got a lot to do with it. I'm not mm-hmm. going to throw that aside. But actually, evidence points to the fact that the true true vampires feed off of spiritual essence, life essence, or the life force of people. Um, that is the interesting aspect of the vampire. Yeah. You know, blood has a lot to do with all of this. And I did label, I kind of titled the show Bloodlust, okay, because... Uh, You know, even with some of these uh, things that I look into as far as remote viewing goes with the dog man and the werewolves, a lot of them Uh are after blood and they do have a bloodlust and they're going Uh for adrenalized blood. And uh, and so I think that's kind of connected. That's that's the animal animal kind of part of it where, you know, we're supposed to say a rabid animal, once it tastes human blood, it never stops. Mm-hmm. Uh, wanting that uh, that's an animalistic part of it and some of that is based in folklore really just and some of it's true though mm-hmm. but some of it is based a lot in folklore I mean you know a lot of well, poor dogs and animals and stuff like that are put down because oh they've tasted human blood they'll never be the same again that's not necessarily true uh, in many aspects but um, if that was the case if a dog got just licked a sore on somebody or something, would turn into a ravaging beast. <laughs> but that's not true. Um, but uh, there is that aspect of the blood. You know, the Bible clearly said that made that interesting statement: the blood is the life, mm-hmm. and and your and your DNA is found what in your blood. You know, that is you. Basically, you are your blood, and so it's your blood type or whatever. So, blood is a mystical connection to that you know to the vampire um more so than the werewolf but you know the werewolf to me i've always considered and we talked about this i think on the previous show that we had uh mm-hmm. the werewolf is considered more of a magical type creature than than dog man would be in some aspects mm-hmm. uh dog man and and the werewolf could be i think a lot of times are very well much evidence to prove that they are misidentified a lot you know if you see a dog man are you going to stop long enough to make sure it's not a dog man and not a werewolf or whatever the case probably not Uh, i would (laughs) you might not want to spend too much time trying to decide on it yeah Yeah. (laughs) but uh, the werewolf is basically in folklore basically more magical type of a creature brought about like the skinwalker through a transformation more so than supposedly. In other words, Dog Man 24 7 is Dog Man. But the werewolf 24 7 might not be a werewolf. He may be a person walking around. It could be your next door neighbor, your, your Sunday school teacher, and you never know it. You know? That's right. Uh, that's the interesting part of the werewolf. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Dennis, I have a question really, really quickly before we uh, move on. Uh, Stephen would like to know if copper has the same effect as gold and silver against cryptids and in humanoids like a vampire. Do you think, do you think copper would work? 
Well, the most interesting part of this metal thing is that just plain silver is not going to do the job, plain gold or copper, whatever you want to use, because it specifically states that this metal has to be blessed. So um, uh, let me let me give you a little something. When I was in law enforcement, uh, I'm retired now, but when I was in law enforcement, I had my bullets blessed. Uh, just because they, was, they would go to what they were supposed to do and they would do it the right way and not harm you. That was a lot of cops did that, believe it or not. Uh, uh, the blessing is the main thing, and that's mm-hmm. where the power lies in this metal. That was just because it's venerated as a holy and more pure metal, mm-hmm. but the blessing that goes with it. I know the, the very famous uh, 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 beast of Gavordan, uh, uh story in France where the guy finally killed the werewolf. He did it with a blessed bullet, by the way, supposedly. Wow. Uh, that's the interesting part of it. it has well, a, it's a spiritual thing, and it has to be taken of and carried of in a spiritual manner. So it changes the vibration of the metal, probably, on a spiritual level. That, that's got a lot to do with it. You know, some metals vibrate better or take vibrations better than, uh, than other metals. Uh, you, it would be hard Although iron is considered a, a big thing against uh, fairies and stuff like that, mm-hmm. witches too, for that matter. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the properties of iron is the fact the very denseness of it. Of course, it's not as dense as lead, but iron comes out of the ground more naturally that way. See, that's what they were always saying about this back in the old days. It came out that way. That makes it more venerable to use, you know, instead of being changed when you smell when you smelt your iron, you get steel. You go into the steel process. Um, I've had a lot of people come to me. This is steel. Can I still use it for dust? Well, it's iron too. You know, <laughs> that's the uh, interesting part of it. But um, the metal, you know, uh, and a lot. A lot of people have supposedly used crystals against these things. Uh, mm-hmm. Not just metal. Just you know, crystal rock. Uh, uh, de- definitely, uh, uh, I've got one here. As a matter of fact. Uh, I'm, I'm here at my desk. <laughs> I have one here. Very oh, big yeah. crystal. And uh, crystals uh, supposedly have a sort of, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. That, that. They supposedly have a uh, supernatural aura, aura about them uh, that they are supposed to hold off or, or be against these. Uh, yeah, you like me. When I move something, a thousand other things move. I drop everything. Um, yeah. I, I, mean, I, I might not be cluttered up. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, these these metals have to be blessed, and that, that puts the, the pow to them, you know? Mm. Uh, so, yeah, they have wrought iron fences around cemeteries, mm. they say. That's another thing. That's a very interesting observation. Uh, if you go, if, you know, a lot of these graves, of these older graves, you see, have an, an iron covering. Oh, you've seen those, I know. That. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, well, those were too full. Well, up is all oh, that's to keep vampires, but no, not really. That was actually made to keep our body snatchers, uh, to, 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 you know, keep anybody from messing with the corpses. Yeah. Um, although it would help if they were a vampire trying to get out, I guess, you know. That's that right. Would, that that's that's that. interesting because it's it works two ways. It keeps them in and keeps them out. <laughs> so, But, you know, according to legend, the actual vampire is supposed to be able to turn itself into a mist. So that cage would not work. Um, you know, uh, it was, like I said, it has more of a spiritual nature to it than the werewolf. Um, I was going to tell you a little quick story of my own run-in with a vampire. Oh, please or, do. Well, something like that. <laughs> uh, I got a couple of them I won't tell you today. But anyway, this one uh, had to do with a sort of vampire spirit. Um, there was a, uh, a case I had. I think it was in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, well, this uh, lady contacted me and said, uh, I've got, I may have a voodoo problem. And uh, uh, well, actually, I met her through another group. Another group didn't have that much experience with voodoo. They contacted me and said, can you help this lady out? And I said, well, I'll talk to her. And uh, she contacted me. I may have a voodoo problem. I said, well, that's very interesting. Uh, what, what, what makes you say that? She said, well, a, a lady moved across the street from me in this house. And she came over to see me. 
And, you know, like a neighbor would when you first move in the neighborhood, you go try to be neighborly, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, this uh, lady came to see me, and she brought me a bottle of some kind of black liquid, about so big. Uh Uh-oh. And uh, she said, put this in your house. It's a blessing. It'll bless your house and all that. She said, I'm a Mama Loa. Now, Mama Loa, people not um, too familiar with that Mm -hmm. term, is a, um, a voodoo priestess. A female voodoo priestess. The the, the male is called a papa loa. Mm-hmm. Um, the mama loa is supposed to be a very powerful um, type of a voodoo priestess. And she said, "I'm a I'm a mama loa, and I'll take care of you." You know, such as that. Well, this lady, being a, somewhat of a uh, very Christian lady, this kind of scared her. She did not like this too well. Of course, it disturbed her a lot. And she said, but I took the bottle and I threw it away. I told her when I first saw I wish you hadn't done that, by the way. <laughs> Don't do that. That's not the correct way to, to uh, dispose of this. But she said that when she contacted me, the Mama Loa had moved out of the house. She was gone out of the neighborhood. And um, she said, ever since this woman gave me that bottle, bad things have been happening. She said, uh, uh, it's just been one thing of bad luck after another. Her and her husband actually ran a dog grooming place in this house. And they lived next door in another house to this. So one house was used for the shop and the other one was to live in. And she has been going on in both houses. But this worst year where she left, the, you know, gave me the liquid, which mm-hmm. was in the shop. part. And she said, Mr. Girl, I used to could do 10 or 15 dogs a day. And it wouldn't nothing to it she said now i can hardly do one or two mm-hmm. she said i come home and i just lay down i'm just exhausted for no reason she said i went to the doctor they checked me out there's nothing physically wrong with me what's going on you know well when i heard this jessica i immediately said ah this woman has given this other this mama mama Loa has placed a vampire spirit upon this woman and uh I said, this woman, this uh, is not a good deal because this thing eventually will take all of your life essence out of you for that to keep going on and on. So I told the lady about this. I said, uh, I looked around her house for any fetishes that might have been left. Sometimes when you place a voodoo curse, you've got to leave a fetish of some sort. Um, but I couldn't find it. I didn't find anything. But I wish she hadn't have thrown that liquid away because then we could have maybe handled it a little bit differently. But anyway, I said, let me. Let me bless your house. I bless you, your house, and all this stuff. Well, here was the dramatic part of it. I found in the closet, and on the ceiling, there was a weird stain. And they didn't have an upstairs. They had an attic, but it was what we call half attic. You know, it's not a real full attic. You couldn't go up there and live in it if you had to or nothing. A half attic is half finished, in other words. But in this closet, uh, in the ceiling, was a perfect stain of 666. If you took a marker and done it, but it was a stain of some sort. Well, I told her first, I said, you uh, you get some white paint and go over that stain when I get done today. Uh, Paint it over. Get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But I went down in the basement. They had a full basement. But it was a what it's called an open basement. In other words, uh, you could see the uh, vents to the outside in this basement. And I had a fellow with me, and I started, we started down, down these steps. And here's the weird part. Before I could cast the holy water, before I could begin even the ceremony of the blessing, this uh, wind rushed past us. I mean, just out of nowhere. And outside that day, there was no wind. It was a very still day. And this wind, and the guy with me said, did you see that? I said, no, I didn't. He said, well, it was like a dark shadow past us, hmm. leaving this basement. Wow. And here's the weird thing. It, when it went through past me and up the steps of the basement, there was a loud, bam, a loud noise upstairs. And when I got finished with the basement, I went back up, and I said, did somebody knock something over up here, or what happened? You know, he said, no, we heard the noise. But we were just sitting here. Well, a lot of times when an evil type spirit leaves a place, it leaves in a boisterous kind of way. It, in other words, it'll knock something over. It'll make a noise or something like that. And I knew that's what happened. Mm-hmm. But that was the end of the voodoo curse. The woman got better. 
she's got the back back to doing 10 and 12 dogs today. And she called me up later after that. She said, I don't know what you've done, but it's gone. I said, mm -hmm. well, from now on, you know, try not to keep the mama loas out of your house. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, you know, Dennis, I actually, um, I, I have come across people during my lifetime and I'm going to say in the recent years, okay, who um, were, you know, came into my life wanting to be my friend, okay, like super nice people, down to earth, you know, and they start noticing little things about them. And they, they you know, you they, do, they want to know a lot about you, you start telling them some of your life story. And then you somehow, I get told, well, I, you know, they, they practice black magic or something. And, uh, you know, and I'm not into that stuff, me personally. Okay. Uh, but then you find out and they start bragging about putting hexes and curses on people and putting people in jars and all this stuff. Yeah. Well, that can be very dangerous. Okay. Um, and so, and, and these people are very, usually quite narcissistic in tendency, I will tell you. Okay. And not all, not everyone that does this is, but the people that I've encountered recently, um, have been in some way. And so I've had to distance myself from a lot of those people because the minute that I, I'm sure they have put hexes and curses on me. I'm sure they've been, yeah, I'm yeah. sure they've attempted. Yeah, like that. You yeah. ever see that cartoon, that uh, cartoon the little guy walking down the street on a bright sunny day and there's a cloud raining over him, you know? That's what a curse is, basically. It, it gets in your life and messes everything up, you know? Right. And you have to be very careful about what kind of gifts people give you, like plants, okay? Any kind oh, of yeah. plant uh, that it, it could be cursed of, of some way, and you put that in your house and all hell breaks loose, you know? Jewelry. Oh, yeah. Anything like that. Uh, you know, that. Uh, I've had many, many, many cases like that. I, that's the first thing I ask them. What, have you brought anything in your house lately? Um, you know, I had a lady contact me. And said, uh, I've got some weird stuff going on. The doors are opening, cabinets are opening, uh, water turning on. Said, was weird stuff going on in my house. Never has happened before. Yeah. We built this house. I know the history of where I'm living. Is What happened? And I said, well, have you brought anything in recently? You know? And, uh, and she said, well, no, I don't think of it. Well, there was. I bought a little love seat at a yard sale a few weeks yeah. back. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Find out some of the history on that if you can. Go back and talk to the people you bought this from and tell me what you find out. But, you know, she called me back a week later and said, how did you know? I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, how did you know about the love seat? I said, I didn't know anything about the love seat, you know. What, what do you know about it? She said, well, there's a man committed suicide on this love seat. Oh, gosh. Wow. It, and they sold it at a yard sale. Oh. Well, I have a, okay. Crystal has a question today. Uh, what if you're offered things like that? And you can't throw it away. What if it's something that you just can't throw away? I mean, like a couch, do you burn it? <laughs> well, if you get something like that uh, given to you, don't throw it away. That's why I say about it, like Ouija boards. You wouldn't believe how many cases I've had connected with Ouija boards. But anyway, you don't you don't want to uh, burn it that way. You don't want to throw just throw it in the trash. Don't do that. This is an object that has something attached to it. So it has to be dealt with. Uh, in a certain way, the best thing to do is to bury it. Bury it. Uh, yeah, to bury it. And here's the interesting thing: you bury it, you salt it. I would salt, sea salt it. Say a prayer over it, whatever faith you believe in. Say that prayer over it. Leave it there. Turn around, walk away. And if you, even if you hear your name called, do not look back. Uh, don't and don't ever go back to where you buried that thing. You know. Uh, uh, I had an interesting story about a girl that said, um, uh, told me that she said, I heard about you talking about the, the Ouija board and I had one in my house and we had some freaky stuff and I got rid of it. And, uh, I said, what do you, she said, I said I'm going to get rid of it. What do I do? And I said, well, you need to bury it. Take it. But I told her what to do. Don't break it. Don't do anything like that. Bury it. That sort of that kills it. Sort of, you know, as a symbolic way of actually killing something like that. Wow. And I said, bury it, and uh, and don't, you know, and that'll be it. Your your problem should be solved. Well, she called me a couple of weeks later. I said, Mister Carroll, what do I do if the Ouija board comes back? And I said, well, what do you what, what do you mean comes back? And she says, it's back. I buried it, but it's back and it's on my porch. She said, but I think some of my friends may have known. I said, well, look, you take that thing back, bury it somewhere else. Don't tell anybody what you're doing. Don't ever go back there again. I think it'll solve your problem. And it gets you some new friends, by the way. <laughs> 
uh, because they're not helping you any. Uh, but that that's a weird thing. But, you know, that's the way it goes with these so-called cursed objects. Uh, you have to take care of them in the correct way. And a, a lot of times, um, we don't know it, but we issue, Jessica, these invitations into our life in different ways. And that's not a good thing. Uh, and, but, you know, when it comes to demonology, the vampire spirit is a very well-known part of, uh, of demonology. Um, it is the spirit that inhabits certain things. It can even inhabit animals to a certain extent. Uh, it is a very bad, in other words, a very bad type of demonic spirit. Wow. Dennis, oh, first of all, Bigfoot Michigan, Rob, thank you for that super sticker. It, he's going to be in Texas, everybody, at the Bigfoot Conference. Y'all go see him in Texas Front Porch. Um, but yeah, um, uh, do you consider yourself a demonologist, Dennis? Well, I guess you would call me a demonologist. Uh, yeah. I studied it for a long time. I don't. The actual true real demonologists in this world are sanctioned by the Catholic Church. I'm not Catholic, so I'm, I'm not connected with the Catholic Church. But the true demonologists are. I've met them. I know them. I've consulted with some of them. Uh, they know their stuff very well, too. But the blessing that I've done, the, the type of things I call spiritual cleansing, are mostly location type cleansings. Uh, I get, I've done thousands of them. Uh, I mean, uh, I have gone to murder sites, suicide sites, uh, a lot of these dark, dark places where these things take place. And there is a spiritual stain on these places, you know. Um, the worst kind of all, I think, is the elemental type haunting, but we'll, we'll get into that some other time. That's a very interesting part of it. But the elemental type is the strongest of type spirits uh, to get rid of or mm -hmm. to get or to, uh, relocate, in other words. Yeah. Um, but I do bless people, too. People ask, of course, that's part of the actual thing is you bless people objects animals i bless pets you do the whole thing because whoever or whatever dwells there is what you're you're trying to put a shield around hmm. yeah i mean I, I feel like i need to be shielded from vampires right now um and werewolves how do we shield ourselves dennis uh is, is there some kind of energetic way that we can shield ourselves from well, it, and a, like a that. lot has got to do, a lot mm -hmm. just has got to do with the positivity. Yeah. Um, the, the positive things in your life negate the negative things. Mm -hmm. uh, the more positive you have in your life, the more positive your attitude, uh, the better you can sort of put these things off. Or as I used to say, it's like water off a duck's back. Uh, if you've got that, that, that bumper there, you know, but it, like I said earlier, you've got to be very careful of things that you invite into your life. Yeah. The wrong people, the wrong mm -hmm. things that you can do. Uh, look how much the uh, demonic connects up with alcohol and drug abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, or, and, and there are different things like gambling. People can be addicted to pornography. People can be addicted to anything that you can be addicted to. These things are open invitations for these type of spirits and forces to work in your life for good or bad. And most of the time it's bad. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But, I mean, uh, I, I've seen people that have addictions have look like they've been taken over by something, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The eyes I tell people, I tell, I tell people that, you know, if you're like, uh, if you believe in the pagan way of uh, religions that you can envision that circle of white light around you that you carry that with you wherever you go and all that. A lot has got to do with your mindset on this, you know, and it's like I say with the Christian people, like with the cross, uh, that cross is just a piece of metal, but it's what it symbolizes and what it symbolizes for you, you know, is what makes it so much more powerful, you know, in its respect. Uh, so a lot of this is the mindset of how you deal with these forces. If uh, you have that faith, um, that's the bumper, that shield. It's like an actual tro uh, Spartan shield, mm -hmm. but like the Spartans carried it, or it, it deflects these things off of you. But you've got to be very careful how you live your life. That's the main thing, because uh, the way you live your life is the way you, it's like I've said this before. If you're just 
negative, negative, negative. What do you expect to get back? You know, <laughs> that's what you're yeah. going to get back. But if you're positive, you put forth a positive thing, you're going to most of the time get some positive stuff back from it. And that's good. That's yeah. good. Because you start vibrating on a different level. And so your vibrational frequency is different. And that's why I'm always telling people to raise your vibrational frequency, do things that make you happy try new stuff, learn new things, you know, just, um, and, and, and get rid of anything that's holding you back and holding you down. Yeah. And you know, uh, the eyes and the ears are the windows to the soul. Yeah. What we take into our lives can affect us and make us what we are. We are truly, uh, products of our environment. And if we're in a bad environment and I have seen these forces cause very bad environments, believe me. Uh, if we are in those bad environments, uh, what do we expect is going to happen? You're going to get bad stuff out of it. Yeah. That's Will just what William's in the chat. William Nighthawk. Hey, William. Uh, this is an interesting comment. He said, Amish man made furniture out of a tree that was a hanging tree. Every piece of furniture was sold and returned later because of poltergeist activity in Amish homes. The guy burned it and all released evil upon the town. True story. The man should have actually, he could wow. have broken it, that's fine. He should have broke it down and just buried that whole thing. And it probably, that would have killed it right there. But uh, he foolishly burned it. He should not have burned it. Um, the only time fire is used to cleanse something is in a ceremonial type way. Uh, it's not just to burn something up, get rid of it. Um, it has to be in a ceremonial type of thing and uh, and all. Uh, the Native Americans knew that very well, and so do a lot of the European peoples understand that fire is a cleansing thing, mm -hmm. or it can sometimes be a, uh, a almost holy type thing in, in the way it is used. But it depends a lot on just like everything else in this world, just, just how it's used, what the true intention is behind it. Yeah. Now, uh, Susie has a question. What if someone else finds whatever you buried out there? Is that safe? Uh, if someone that's else, not is, good. <laughs> it's not good. No, okay. it, would, it would not be good. No, it would not be good. to bring. Be careful what you dig up and bring back home. Don't right. do that. That's like I tell people. Did you know that a lot of curses, or we call them devil traps, are mm -hmm. placed in cemeteries and graveyards for people to get up, uh, pick up, and take back home with them? They just do that for fun. That's just like what some people do for fun, see how much misery they can cause in the world. Do not take anything. Never take anything out of a cemetery. That's a bad idea. Oh, no. yeah. So no graveyard yeah. dirt. I hear that a lot, that uh, witches do that. They take graveyard dirt. I don't know what for, but it doesn't sound good. Yeah. Well, you know, here's, here's the interesting thing, speaking of what I know about demonology. Uh, demons haunt cemeteries more than actually the dead do. Do they? So most of the time, the dead, I think, in real life, go on to where they need to go. Uh, they don't hang around their dead bodies, but the demonic does. I have seen a lot of evidence where uh, even you, even if you are possessed when you die, the demons do not even want to really let go of your body then. They can follow that body from morgue to funeral home to, to the cemetery. I've seen that happen. I have a very famous case about that, but I'll tell you about it sometime. Okay. Where uh, this lady's remains, her ashes, were still attached by demonic forces. Um, it's true. It does happen. That is why the demon is known to inhabit places of the dead. Mm. That's why they do that. Yeah. Uh, if you might remember the very famous story in the Bible about the demon act that Jesus ran into, I consider him the very first demonologist, by the way. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, it was in a cemetery. You know, he, he had the guy mm -hmm. in a cemetery. They live in these places of the dead. Mm -hmm. And that's why I've told a lot of people, it's been my uh, surmise that Many times when you encounter something in the cemetery, it's not usually the spirit of a human. It's mostly probably demonic in nature. Interesting. Because that's what's hanging out there. <laughs> well, it's, I, I've heard that a lot of, uh, let's just say like satanic rituals and things like that, uh, take place in 
places like a graveyard or somewhere that's like kind of scary and like a landfill or something that's really dark. Yeah, and, yeah. Any know. place of the dead. It could be a, mm -hmm. a junkyard or anything junkyard. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. where werewolves come in too a little bit. Uh, but before we jump to the werewolves again, let's... TCR44 uh, was wondering if uh, if we have uh, uh, if we've ever heard of an old vampire family or families in New Orleans known as the Immortals. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, uh, yeah. there have been some instances in history supposedly of were vamps. I don't know if you've ever heard that term. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually, they are kind of cool vampire werewolves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that's a bad combination right there. If you think about it. Uh, that's supposed to be uh, the um, the hybridization of the werewolf and the vampire. There we uh, go. Got a picture. Now that right know. there is a picture of what would be called a typical wolf man. Now let me explain something about the wolf man and the werewolf. The wolf man still has a lot of attributes of the human. Okay. Uh, the mm -hmm. werewolf does not. Now, if you might remember the most very famous movie, The Howling. Yes. You remember how the uh, the werewolf changed? It looked more like an actual wolf. It did. But now the wolf man, the wolf man looks like that. He has mm -hmm. more of the attributes of a man, but he still has the beast part of him. Mm -hmm. uh, the wolf man is supposedly even more dangerous than the werewolf. For the very fact is that he, although has the body and strength of the beast, he still retains the mind of a man which makes him a very dangerous creature, most of all. Yeah. Uh, so there are different types of werewolves, uh, just as there are supposedly different types of dogmen. Uh, you got to go into the basic subcultures on this stuff and all that. I like that question you had up earlier about the immortals in New Orleans. I'm going to get yes. to a story about that in a minute. Um, I run in with a, a, my other run in with a vampire. Um, I'm a, told this i think i think i've done another show but it's a very interesting thing that happened to me um i was in charleston charleston south carolina it's a very beautiful city one of the most haunted cities in the in the world actually new orleans is another one by the way. and savannah um, too is a pretty good one. Oh well, yeah yeah I, I love charleston here till it still retains a lot of the old uh, southern flavor to it and uh, it is haunted to high heavens. I mean, you've got everything you want in Charleston. Um, I have actually been on the battery where they hung the pirates and ran into a column of strange, freaky mist out there. I never have run into anything like it since then. It was a very interesting experience. So there are a lot of haunted areas in uh, in Charleston. But one of the most fascinating places in Charleston, oh, I've been in to every nook and cranny there is there. Um, are the cemeteries, uh, the the big mm -hmm. graveyards, church churchyards that are in the center of Charleston? I don't know if you've ever been to Charleston, oh, yeah. you know what I'm talking Beautiful. about. Beautiful, yes. Well, I was in one of these one day. Uh, mm -hmm. It was in autumn. It was an autumn day, about very much like today. It was a dark, cloudy day. It was probably like four in the afternoon, something like that. And um, um. I was walking around, I, I think, what I was actually looking for, I was looking for one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, supposed to be buried there. I did find it, too, by the way. Oh, nice. And anyway, um, and it was unusual that, that he didn't have a big monument and just a little plaque on it. It, it was one of the signers. But anyway, wow. I, was look, I was looking around. I'm no stranger to some graveyards. I've been in many of them. And I find them to be some of the most interesting and peaceful places you can go. Um so I'm walking around looking, and all of a sudden, just out of the side, this, this woman is with me, this young lady. Mm -hmm. I would put her probably early, mid-20s. And she's a nice-looking young lady, and she had, and what struck me, and I've always taught myself to observe as much as possible of anything. That's part of the cop in me, and I was taught, drilled into my head to observe everything. Um. I noticed that right off that she had some very interesting clothing on. Uh, she had sort of like a skirt, and it had like a, I think you would call it maybe a bodice type thing to it, mm -hmm. and a blouse. And she looked kind of, it kind of looked what we in the South would call old-timey, old-time looking clothes, but yet it had a little modern aspect to it as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe it had modern pieces to it and all that. 
So she's real friends. Says, "Hey, how you doing?" And I shook her hand. You know, she shook her hand, and um, and uh, she said, "My name is Claire," or something like that. And she said, I, I forget the last name that she told me. I never know. That. But she said, "My name's Claire," and I said, "Well, my name's Dennis. How you doing?" You know, and, and I noticed right off, Jessica, when I shook her hand, it was like the hand of a dead person. It was cold, it was cold. And clammy, huh? It was it was clammy, like and. I did, you know, I just thought, well, maybe some of, we've all run into some uh, handshakes like that once in a while. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it, 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 it didn't strike me as that odd at the time, you know. And um, and it just kind of registered there, you know. Yeah. And um, so she kept walking with me through the cemetery. We were just walking. She was talking, you know, just mundane things. And um, real pretty girl. And she mm -hmm. said, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she said, well, you know, I'm a vampire. Okay. And so I said, all right, you know. <laughs> Protect your neck. Protect your neck. Uh, that kind of, oh, kind of got me there for a minute. Yeah, I kind of get an interesting way to open the conversation. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, that's that's interesting. And here's why I thought. Here's what I thought she was talking about. You know, that every every major city in the world, Paris, France, uh, London, England, New Orleans, Seattle, all these cities have a cult of vampires. Uh, the people that actually kind of worship vampires, they want to be vampires. They, they they have the things and they actually some even drink blood. I mean, they get very serious about this stuff. That's what I thought this lady was. You know, I thought, oh, OK, she's one of those of the yeah, vampire society. Goth. You know? Gothic, yeah, they right? call them societies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I thought. So, well, I said, well, how long have you been a vampire? You know, and she, she said, said oh, long. Years. <laughs> a long, long time. That's what she said. A long, long oh. time. I said, "Well, that's interesting." I said, uh, 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 "You want to?" This is what I asked her. Paul called. Says, "As a writer, you're always interested in learning people's story, you know, because there's been a lot of interesting stories out there." Mm -hmm. I have a saying that no story should ever be lost to history. No story. Right. So I said, um, "Are you one of these uh, in one of these uh, goth vampire cults?" You know, because she looked a little goth too. You know, mm -hmm. she had a little little bit of makeup on, and um, and so uh, she said, "No, I'm a real vampire." I said, "You mean real vampire?" She said, "Yeah, I drink blood. I'm I'm a real vampire." I said, well, that's very interesting, you know. Uh, how did you know? She said, well, I I was turned or something. So I'm beginning to think maybe I should distance myself from this yeah. person. <laughs> because this is really getting freaky, you know, getting really weird. That's why you carry uh, a, a spike in your back pocket when you go to a thing. Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, I, didn't, I didn't have my garlic with me or anything. You know, so, uh, so I said to her, I said, uh, well, that's very interesting. And I kind of was looking around, looked at another grave. It looked kind of interesting. I've been over looking. I looked up. She's gone. And I think to myself, oh, wait a minute. There's no way this woman could have got away from me that quick. Because there's a big cemetery. I could see there's no place for her to hide. And I start looking. She's, you know, down behind one of the tombstones here or what, you know. And I get to look and I look around. I can't find her anywhere. And all of a sudden I look up and here's the freaky part. I look up and Jessica, there's the biggest bat I've ever seen in my life flying across <laughs> The sky, I mean, it's gone outside. I mean, it was eagle side bad. I've daytime? never seen one of it. And I'm what going, oh, I'm going, I'm looking at this. I'm saying, nobody is ever going to believe this. <laughs> <laughs> but I went back the next day, and I remember all that, the, the handshake and all this, and the, and the way she looked and all. She was very pale. And I went back the next day, and I got looking around in that area. I was hoping I'd see her again, but, it, you know, I didn't. I found a tombstone of a girl named Claire, not too far from that, and the wow. date on it would have put her at about that age. Wow. That was a very interesting coincidence. Or was it a coincidence? I don't think it's a coincidence. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think of all, anyone who would ever run into a vampire, it would be Dennis Carroll, I believe, yeah. in a graveyard. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of comments here. Um, uh, Donna is in the chat. She said that she experienced a grim reaper at a mental hospital where she works. Now, what book could that have been, Dennis? Do you think? Well, I have actually seen the angel of death. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it is an angel, I guess you would call it. You would that would be the terminology for it. It is not a good thing. It is really not a pleasant subject per se. But it wouldn't surprise me if you saw something like that. But um, I'm going to tell you something about a lot of these spiritual type beings. They will often appear to you in a form that is familiar to you. Uh, they may not be the cut, uh, cut and dry type. Hollywood form, but it may be what you've got of the impression in your mind this thing may be, and that may be what they will appear to you to be. Mm-hmm. But the uh, the glimpse, the very quick glimpse, I call it the angel of death. I was dying actually. Um, I saw it just briefly. Was a shadow type thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a. I, the only way I can say is sort of a winnowing, moving type shadow. Um, uh, so it would not surprise me if you saw something like that, because mm-hmm. a lot of times, like I say, these things will appear uh, with the image that you're most familiar with. You know, I've, uh, I've um, studied a lot of very uh, interesting near-death experiences in my time, and uh, uh, people claim to see their rel- law, you know, gone relatives, relatives that have been deceased for a long time. You may you may see a lot of interesting different types of images when you get to that close point of death or, or where mm-hmm. there is death at, in other words, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I, I worked in a hospital for 30 years, and I'm going to tell you, that's one of the most haunted places you can be around. Uh, I can tell you some stories about that. <laughs> but uh, 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 I investigated a haunted ambulance one time uh, that was actually supposedly haunted by the paramedic that drove it who was killed in an automobile accident and they came to me one day and said uh, there's something freaky going on with our ambulance and uh she said there's like stuff being moved around in it that 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 this uh this man and he died in an automobile accident we was off duty by the way and mm-hmm. um said that he would used to there was a certain way he would pack stuff in the ambulance you know the ambulance has a lot of supplies to it and I said, we, it's almost as if he's going in behind us and changing stuff kind of a thing, you know. And I thought that was interesting that uh, a haunted ambulance. I, I've, I've investigated a lot. Of, I investigated a haunted Burger King one time. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> so, hey, so we love yeah, our Burger it, King. We love our yeah, Burger Actually, it, it wasn't. You, you get more with your burger and fries there. But anyway, yeah. uh, um, it was actually built on a haunted location. It wasn't Burger oh. King itself. Yeah. Well, that you know. Okay, so this is this is interesting that you brought that up. There's we have a couple of large lakes here in Georgia where I live. One's Lake Altoona, one's Lake Lanier. Um, I have uh, when I've been assigned targets to do remote viewing, uh, I didn't know what I was looking at because they're they're blind targets, but they were actually missing people or people who had died. And there were there were at least one of these people was it was uh, killed and then put in one of the lakes. Okay, now a lot of people dump bodies in those lakes. Okay. And, uh, right. and that's something the general public may not be familiar with. Also, uh, those lakes were made when they flooded out the towns there. And so the graveyards were covered up the churches, the homes, the stores, yeah. the general stores, there's trees down there. These lakes are haunted, Dennis. I am convinced. And a lot of people drown in those lakes, especially Lake Lanier. Oh, it's yeah. notorious for drowning. And I believe that it's not just people jumping in and getting caught in a tree, but they're haunted. Okay. Well, that there's a, uh, an interesting spot not too far from where I live that I've had a lot of reports on that this young lady, um, it's Harwell Lake. I'm sure you've heard of Harwell Lake. Yes, totally. Um, been there. She actually grounded in this part, and the, her, she has supposedly been seen standing on the side of the road, dripping wet, even in the dead of wintertime. Um, haunting the very near location of where she supposedly drowned. That's almost as if she's coming out of the lake looking for help. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've heard several reports on that. Then there's the, uh, the case of the, uh, the hitchhiker in Wahala who supposedly died in a plane crash. And he is only seen on rainy days. He's wearing a slicker and he tries to catch a, to hitch a ride with you. Uh, and when you take him where he, he wants to go and he asks for a specific location, when you get there, there's nothing left but a puddle of water in the seat. Uh, <gasps> wow. So you have some interesting yeah. things like that to go on in the neighborhood. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, Dennis, I also, um, I have a question for you too. Now, War Criminal said that uh, when, I guess, well, I'm going to assume it's a he, okay? Please forgive me. Yeah, yeah. Worked to suicide and had uh, something follow him home. Oh. Okay. And, uh, and so when, when someone commits suicide, I mean, I've, I've known more than one person in my lifetime, one person very close to me that did commit suicide uh, or completed uh -huh. suicide. And, uh, and some say that uh, it opens up a portal. And I did see that comment earlier that suicides and, and people who died, die horrific deaths. Uh, it, it could open up a portal. Now, how do you feel about that? Is that something that's, that happens? Well, actually, I had a very distinctive case, very much like that, that um, actually this thing followed these people home. And then what it was, they went to a, um, a suicide place and some member of the family committed suicide there. And he had been dabbling, I think, very heavily into uh, occult dark arts. Mm -hmm. And he had two mirrors crossed. You know, it's a good idea never to cross mirrors, by the way. Really? You know, mirrors that face each other. Because if you've ever done that or ever seen that, it's like looking into infinity. It is. It's the perfect way to supposedly magically open a portal. But anyway, he had committed suicide with the, I think, the, the, the satanic Bible and all this stuff. The paraphernalia was there between these mirrors. And he went there to clean it. They didn't want his mother to find out about this. Uh, didn't want his mother to know what circumstances he died under. So they went there to clean all this stuff up, and this spirit that was there actually followed them home. And, I mean, it was one of the worst cases I've ever run into. I actually had to go back to that house three times to finally get rid of that thing. Mm -hmm. And what basically they had, had followed them home, you know, there are different types of demons, and we'll get into that. Some of That might be another show some other yeah. time. But there are different types of demons, and this demon was what is called the lurker at the threshold type demon. He's a guardian demon. And you bring it forth through witchcraft, dark witchcraft. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of like a bodyguard to get you to do stuff for you that you want to do. And it can take different forms, by the way. It can take the form of a very large black cat. And I'm not talking about a house cat. We're talking leopard size type cat here. Mm -hmm. That can go forth and actually commit demonic murder. Uh, that's another story for another time. But anyway, that's, I think a lot of sightings of these black cats may be associated with some of that stuff. But um, these are guardian demons, and they're very bad guys. They're sort of the, the worker demons of the hive, you might say. Mm -hmm. And that's what followed these people home, and uh, they are bad dudes to, to do anything with. Believe me, they're bad. Wow. Now, Dennis, my friend Tony uh, is in the chat today and he had a comment earlier I put up, but I just flashed it up for a second. He was saying that he believes that uh, demons or negative energies can come into your home through your television and your electronics. I believe that, too. And so there are certain shows that I don't watch on my television anymore, including murder shows, shows about murder, shows about, uh, you know, uh, summoning demons like on even on Ghost Adventures. I quit watching Ghost Adventures. That was my favorite show. But they started doing rituals and chanting rituals on television. Live. Oh, absolutely. I, it's uh, absolutely. super bad. OK, super bad. That's the, the ghost in the machine thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I believe without a doubt that there are uh, a certain spirits attached to this image, whether it comes through a television or through a radio or whatever, you know, or, or a video game. Uh, there are certain spirits that surround these things. Um, like I said before, there are demons who do nothing but this stuff all day. That's their job. And, uh, and they do their job, unfortunately, very well. Um, they have. Uh, they attack the mind. You know, I told you before, there are four specific ways that demonic attacks us, and that is physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. Mm -hmm. They uh, they work on these four areas, and whichever one that you are weakest in, whether it be one, two, or three, or ever how many or not, that is what they will attack, because it makes good sense to attack your enemy at his weakest point, whatever it may be. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know what? I was just having a conversation with, I think it was Barry Littleton yesterday. Uh, you know, I, I, I am, I've gotten to the point to where like, I, I don't 
care what people think so much anymore about me. Okay. And I know it's kind of bad in some ways because I've lost sense of like, you know, um, being so self-conscious like I used to be. And, uh, and so, you know, Dennis doing the, the, the public shows that I do and things like that, people can be kind of mean sometimes when they leave comments, when I go on other people's shows and that Mm kind of happened this week and it's fine. Uh, but it, it didn't, it doesn't affect me, you know, like it would have maybe a couple of years ago. And, uh, and I, it's really not a reflection on me. It's on them, you know, blah, 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 that stuff. Uh, but, but, you know, Barry and I were talking about how sometimes, especially people who are speaking out like you and I are doing right now, we do get attacked quite a bit online from, it might be robots for all I know. It may not even be real people, but there's no. a, an interest in, uh, there's a, a vested interest in shutting people up from, first of all, talking about these things uh, oh, and, yeah. uh, and, and to go back and, and, and just clam up, you know, and, uh, and so it's so important to get yourself, get your self-esteem up. Okay. And to, uh, and to shine your light and to be happy and find peace and love in your heart. Uh, so oh, yeah. that, so th- these things kind of bounce right off of you when they do come oh, in. Yeah, it, hey, it, hey, hey. it gives you thicker skin. It it, does. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you, if you're doing working right, but you know, uh, uh, people that have uh, psychic abilities, people who can do uh, mm-hmm. uh, remote viewing and all that stuff, they have to be very, very, very careful because there are forces out there that take advantage of that. Yes. They can try to mislead you uh, and do worse than that, try to possess you. Uh, mm-hmm. You've got to be very careful, you know, especially dealing with spiritual and mental type things like that. Because there are spirits who specialize in that. And that's what you've got to be very, very careful and guard against uh, when you're doing that time of a work. Because mm-hmm. uh, they are just waiting. And here's what I always say about the demonic. They are beings of opportunity. If you give them an opportunity, if you crack that door open just a little, they're going to take that. They're going to take it big time. They're going to knock that door open, you know, if they can't. So that's what you have to be very careful about. But you can build a patina up against them, mm-hmm. a, a bumper, uh, a psychic type of a, a spiritual thing that that can protect you. But you have to maintain it, though. It's just like the uh, finish on your car. You got the wax it every now and then. You got to maintain it, make sure it's strong, and it stays that way. You're okay. You know, you'll be all right. But uh, if it, if, if you in a moment of weakness, you let that guard down. I talked to a guy one time. He handled snakes, very poisonous snakes, for many, many years. And I asked him, well, you ever get bit? Of course, he said, you know, I get asked that all the time. He said, I did. So I was very, very careful, but I did eventually. One day, I wasn't feeling good. I let my guard down. One day, and that was all it took. And that's, that's what right. all it takes. You let your guard down one time, and that's mm-hmm. it, you know. I think the negative entities are waiting to pounce too. As soon as you're weak, as soon as um, something goes wrong in your life, you know, uh, as soon as someone you love passes away or something, they're going to be there waiting to to get inside. Okay, so we got to be really careful about that. Put on that floor. Uh, uh, you know something. Uh, you know something, Jessica. These guys, these demons, we talk about them. I consider them more or less nothing but spiritual bullies. If you take it off of them, they'll give it to you. But if you stand up to them. That takes a lot of their power away from. That's right. Yeah, it takes the power away when when you are happy, okay, and uh, in a in a higher vibration. Yeah, hopefully that keeps these vampires away too. <laughs> you know, and there's another kind of vampire too, Dennis. There's energy vampires. It's not just regular vampires we have to worry about. Mm. It's more common yeah. to have energy vampires around us who will suck all of your life force out yeah. of you. If you let them. Exactly. exactly. And, you know, uh, uh, like I said, that's where we have to we have to part ways with Hollywood. Uh, the actual real things are far worse than than you're going to see in, in the movies. Um, but I always like the uh, always like uh, the end of the original Dracula, the old with Bela Lugosi, where uh, Edward Sloan came out. You know, he would come out at the end. He was the one that played Van Helsing. You know, uh-huh. Great actor. And he would come out and he would say, hold on just a minute, ladies and gentlemen, before you leave the theater. Just a moment. said, uh, we don't want our vision of Dracula to leave you with bad dreams. So if you go home tonight and you're tempted to look behind the curtain 
or you dread to see a face at the window. It's well, our suggestion. Just, just pull yourself together and remember, after all, there are such things. <laughs> yeah, there are. Yeah, there are such a, things. There are such things. You know, but yes. we're taught that there's those things aren't real. But we should, you know, it's just kind of gothic, you know. Um, yeah, not real. But I'm finding that these things are real. I mean, Bigfoot's real. I'm seeing Dogman's real. Yeah, not, and vampires are real. I mean, yeah, there you go. I don't know. Uh, they say the real monsters are humans, but I don't know. And and. and and, you know, there are other creatures out there that are worse than vampires in some ways. Look at the ghoul. The ghoul is a demonic creature that devours the bodies of the dead. I mean, you don't get much worse than that. Uh, he's sort of the original zombie. Yeah. But, you know, uh, uh, what gets me about the zombies, Jessica, the zombies that you see portrayed in Hollywood are not zombies. Those are not zombies. Those are ghouls. Oh, the walking real, the real zombies. Them. Real zombies don't eat people. Uh, uh, oh, no. Real ones. There are real zombies. There are just as real as you and I, but they don't eat people. What What do they look like, Dennis? What are What do real zombies look like? They would look like us, only a lot worse. <laughs> oh, <laughs> On a very no. bad day, what? they would look they would look a whole lot worse than us. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, I think you would make a cute zombie. But anyway, oh, thank um, you. Uh, I put some lipstick uh, on. I go, you would you, you would look dead. You would look dead, and you would look like glassy eyed. You would be an ultimatum. In other words, you'd be almost like robot. And that is what a real zombie is used for. They were used in the, the sugar cane fields as free labor. They were slave labor, or whatever you want to call them. Um, they were used that way. They were uh, sometimes they were sent out to murder people or get rid of somebody, but that was very seldom. Most of the time, they were just used as slave, cheap slave labor. But they were really under the influence of drugs. They're not really dead, dead people. Really? They look dead. They may look a little dead because of the effect of the drugs. But actually, to make a zombie, you would be like, I would uh, sneak in your house, Jessica, and put something in your coffee. And it would look like you died and you would mm -hmm. be buried. And then I would come back a couple of days later and dig you up because you're not really dead. Mm -hmm. You're really in a catatonic state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would dig you up, revive you with more drugs, but you would still be in such a summonistic state that you would be an actual zombie. You know? But a real zombie is not really, really a, day, a real dead person. Okay. Oh, a okay. real zombie. I did not know that. Yeah. Know uh, that's a very, very well known cases of that in Haiti and uh, uh, different places like that, that these things have actually happened. I know there's one woman. They buried her husband, uh, her brother, ten years before, and saw him walking around in a town one day, and said, "You know, we buried you ten years ago. What are you doing here?" And what it was, he'd been used for ten years as a uh, cheap slave labor uh, in another town that she didn't know about. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Uh, now, is that uh, was his mind brainwashed or something? Like, how did he not know? Did he not remember? Yeah, he did find him when he came out of his state. And one of the antidotes for this uh, drug is supposedly salt, by the way. They do not allow a true zombie to ever have any kind of salt because it has some kind of chemical reaction that offsets this drug. The drug is uh, one of the basic parts of the drug is made from the puffer fish, uh, that, you know, found in the Caribbean. Uh, a lot of times they look dead. You think they are dead and you bury them, but they're really not dead. And uh, yeah. and so these ma these papaloas, the witch doctors, whatever name you want to call them, they know how to administer these drugs. And they are very dangerous drugs, by the way. So I, I caution people out there listening, watching us, don't try that at home, okay? <laughs> uh, these are very dangerous drugs. They can really kill you if you're not careful in how you administer them. But... Uh, that is what a real zombie is. Now, a ghoul, on the other hand, is more demonic, and he devours the bodies. Actually, I wrote a poem about that one time. Uh, he actually devours the bodies of the dead. That's not a nice thing. Wow. wow. The cleanup crew, huh? It's like a vulture. That's terrible. Uh, yeah. Wow. It is sort of like that. But what a, a ghoul is supposed to be a person so low down on the scale, so possessed by the demonic, that he becomes less than an animal, and that's what he becomes more like a uh, carrying, eating type uh, 
uh, death worm or something like that. He goes around eating, and that's how he sustains himself off of the corpses of the dead, of the newly buried dead. Um, that is not nice at all. That's not one of my favorite guys to hang around with. <laughs> no, I would not. I wouldn't want to hang around that either. Yeah, I've I've heard stories of people eating a puffer fish like at a sushi sushi restaurant or something, and it's kind of like. Russian roulette. Okay, so. And the, the, uh, I like a, a question there, that comment, the puffer fish has psychoactive compounds. And what we're talking about here is psychotronic drugs. Of course, the government has got into a lot of that, but that's another story for another time. But anyway, the psychotronic drugs act on the mind and subvert mm -hmm. the thought processes and all that stuff. So it's just a way of brainwashing someone. That's basically what it is. Now, but of course, you make them look like they're dead to get them into that state, you know. Yeah. Now, Dennis, I've heard stories that our government right now, like certain agencies are really interested in demonology and stuff like that. And um, have you have you heard that? And what, what, why would they be know, interested in that? There's a, a lot of conjecture on that, uh, mm -hmm. definitely, uh, where uh, we do know that the, a lot of these psychotronic drugs, a lot of this type of thing. It's been going on since World War II and probably before that, uh, especially the scientists that Hitler had working on these things. Uh, it was not only the super soldier project, but how to control the minds of people. If you could control a soldier's mind completely, you'd have a very, you'd have a super soldier per se, in a way, that way. Uh, of course, there's also talk of hybridization where they actually tried to cross certain species of animals with people uh, to make better soldiers out of them as well. So there was some really freaky, freaky sci-fi stuff that went on with the Nazi scientists. And we, unfortunately, brought them all over here uh, at the end of the war, and they worked for us. Um, oh, yeah. They're, yeah, they're probably still... So that's where a lot of this uh, started, yeah. Uh, yeah. What, well, what do you think about, or what is the probability, do you think, of our military using werewolves and dogmen as super soldiers? Well, that would be part of the hybridization type program. If you can turn like that Wolfman picture you had up earlier, if you could turn mm -hmm. a man into something like that, uh, would you want to fight a soldier that looks like that or can act like that and be like that? Um, the perfect soldier, Jessica, would be a perfect mixture of beast and man. Uh, it would not only be that way, but you would also disconnect the pain and emotion centers of his brain. Mm -hmm. Uh, he would know neither hot nor cold nor pain. He would have no emotion. He would be just like a shark you would run into. If you go swimming in the ocean uh, and you run into a shark, he's not. you're not going to have an argument with him. He's just going to eat you. That's what he exactly. does. Yeah, and he no. has no emotion about it. He doesn't feel anything for you. Uh, think about a soldier yeah. like that who's no longer human, per se, like that. That is a super soldier. Yeah. And I think this picture is from a movie. Okay. So y'all don't come at me with this one, but think about how big that is. Some people say that uh, uh -huh. dog men can be about nine feet tall. Okay. That's really big. Those are normal uh -huh. sized humans. Imagine something that big coming after you, even as a super. Well, uh, okay. I think a lot of times when you get scared by something that you see like that, and that is a scary thing, yeah. uh, your mind kind of enlarges it sometimes to be bigger than it truly really is that's just the way the brain works sometimes uh, it might yeah, it might appear that much larger and it may be that uh, pretty pretty much that size but it can be also larger to you in your state of fright at that time you got to remember that too but um i would put the average dog man to me uh dog man or werewolf would be around eight to nine foot in height, but you look at some of these bears that uh, the, the polar bear and all that. I mean, we're looking at animals 12, 14 foot high, even larger than that in some cases. So it's not that far fetched that something would be that big, definitely. Yeah. I think the very first uh, Bigfoot case I had, uh, one of the very first, um, I went I went to where this thing was sighted and um, Unfortunately, I couldn't find any footprints because it had rained, I think, or something before then. But he had told me that this thing came up and stood beside a sign that was there. It was uh, like a dead-end sign. And I went and measured the sign. He said this thing was higher. Well, he could have, in other words, put an elbow on top of this sign, okay? Uh -huh. 
And wow. I, I measured the sign, and the sign was eight foot. <gasps> wow. You know, that's big. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bigfoots get really big. I mean, I've, I've looked into some, especially up in Alaska, places that, you know, uh, where everything's bigger in Texas and Alaska, I guess. Oh, right? so, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were like 12 feet, 12, 15 huh. feet. Some, some people say they're even bigger than that, you know. Oh, yeah. um, it, it, that's, well, that's you know, uh, when you get to talking about the Nephilim and the giants that supposedly were, and I believe that there was a race of giants on this world mm -hmm. at one time, uh, yeah, you're talking really. about you're talking about men and women who mm -hmm. were 12, 14 foot tall. I mean, come mm -hmm. on. Huh. That's a giant. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't get much bigger than that. And even mountain trolls, by the way, supposedly were described. You don't hear too much talk about mountain trolls. Yeah. But they were supposedly described as being 20 and 25 foot in height. Think about that. Good grief. That is amazing. That's really big. Yeah. Oh, well, I, that always I, reminds me of that Hollywood movie. The uh, What was that? The 30, uh, 50 foot woman, you know? Yeah. That? <laughs> that's up there that's getting up there well you know they're it, maybe they're just leaking out the truth to us through movies and stuff like that i think they do that yeah well i think jessica you know i've told this before uh for my own investigative research over the years i've come to find out that there's a blanket on this world there's a blanket put there purposely over a lot of part of our world and we need to lift that blanket up and look behind it every now and then to see what's really going on because what they want us to see and what really is there are two different things all together. Yeah. Well, you know what? I actually, last week's show I was that I did here on my Wednesday show was with Jesus Payan. And he and I talked about the hidden history of our world in the Tartarian empire. And, uh, and even the mesas that looked like yeah, they could have been gigantic trees that had been cut uh, down. Um, uh, your comment there about the amphetamines, by the way, the soldiers at the end of World War II, that was our soldiers as well as German soldiers, uh, were, were living on amphetamines, by the way. And mm -hmm. it, it kept them going. Wow. And that that is almost like a super soldier. Yeah. Yeah. Like crazy supermen out there and maybe mm -hmm. women. Yeah. That's really scary. Uh, oh. But Not you know, Hollywood, it. Hollywood, uh, I'm going to tell you, I got to say this about Hollywood, okay? And I don't mm -hmm. mean to bad mouth it a lot. Okay. Because it fails movies. But um, they have great researchers, though. I got mm -hmm. to say that. When they when they put these movies out, like, like Captain America with the Super Soldiers and all that, they did their research very well, although they may expound upon it and and uh, 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 put handles on it, they used to say, uh, <laughs> that way. They, uh, to me, uh, they, they have a kernel of truth in them a lot of times, yeah, you know, uh, everything has. My favorite quote is that every myth and legend known to mankind is not without its authentic foundation. Mm -hmm. There's a truth there. And like you say, you seek the truth and that's what you look for because yeah. it's there. You just got to find it, you know. Yeah. You know, that's where uh, my team and I, uh, we go out doing our paranormal field research, Bigfoot research and we run into the ETs and the portals and all that stuff, but the locations are found a lot of times because there's local legends and lore there, you know, witches like spearfinger oh. area, a ghost road or a pig man, a goat man, some sort yeah. of weird cryptid or inhumanoid, you know, out there. And, and when you go there, there's, there's a grain of truth to it. There's a little, there's some truth to it. And, and those are usually areas of high strangeness. Well, I'll tell you in, in my research, I found a lot of these beings to be uh, not only inhuman type things, of course, but that's what they are. But they're also what I call strangers in a strange land. They're not supposed to be here, I don't think. They're not normally appearing here as what they are. In other words, they're coming from somewhere else. That's just what I, my own feeling is. I've actually, well, I think, walked into a portal one day. Uh, I'll tell that story for some other time, but I know that portals exist to a certain extent, whether they can be manipulated uh, by the mental processes or by chemical interaction or by machinery or in other different ways, even ritualistic ways, that these portals can be opened. Uh, and who knows what might come through. Well, that, that gets us into CERN, you know, the Large Hydrant Colliders. 
being uh -huh. turned on. And I mean, it, it leads us into the Mandela effect and the dark entities that come out of these things that they say. And uh, it makes for areas of higher, high strangeness. And, you know, um, right. you know, vibrations got a lot to do. With it. You know, I've heard many, I know you have too, many accounts of these portals where there's like a hum or a vibration mm -hmm. felt. It's even the auditory type humming sound, uh, clicking noise or something. A lot of times these things are described as being coherent with, with these uh, uh, portal type appearances. Uh, that makes me wonder what Tesla said. You know, Tesla said uh, to unlock the secrets of the universe, you must think in forms of uh, uh, sound, vibration, and frequency, and energy, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's very important. That is, I think energy is the basic, I don't have to say this, and it's not that big of a brain jump here for anybody. But energy is the basic fabric of our universe. Mm -hmm. And it's in its, in its content. Whether that energy be dark matter, whatever. It is the basic fabric of time and space. Uh, and a lot of these beings that we've talked about here today, like the vampire, uh, like that, in order, or spiritual type beings, mm -hmm. in order for them to manifest, I think they have to either step through that veil of time and space and manifest from one reality to another. I think that's what's going on. That's why they blink in and out kind of a thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think vibrations has a lot to do. The frequency and vibrations of these things have a lot to do with that. Yeah. You know, Amy uh, brought up metal door latch closing above. Okay, so that that actually spawned a memory I have of uh, some people talking about dogman encounters when they're out in the in the woods, and a lot of times before or after they encounter dogman, they'll uh -huh. hear what sounds like a metal garbage can being slammed on the ground, a uh -huh. really loud metal door slamming out in the middle of nowhere. Do you uh, think that could be a portal or, you know, it could I've be heard that out of a facility underground or something. I mean, uh, I've <laughs> heard of doors, doors being seen out in the desert. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I had a friend that had an experience at Skinwalker Ranch, not far from Skinwalker Ranch, where he says a portal opened up for him and he saw something very much like a dog man that came out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it. You know, there's got to be one basic explanation that will cover a lot more ground on these things. And I think that's what we need to really look more seriously at is this uh, space time thing or this portal or whatever you want to call it, whatever name or title you want to give it. Yeah. It's got to be something very close to the answer of what we're looking for. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm, you know, I do go out in the field and I do go looking for Bigfoot, but uh, I don't know if I want to come across a vampire or a werewolf anytime soon. So. Yeah. Yeah, creatures yeah. of the night. But, but now, you know, the werewolf's very interesting, the fact that it's mostly dark magic. You put on a belt or you put the skin on, you become that animal. Uh, it is witchcraft, dark witchcraft, per se, just like the skinwalker. I call it, I call the werewolf the European equivalent of the skinwalker because they're very much kin to each other. Uh, they're in the same family, although they may go about it in different ways. Mm -hmm. But it's very much of a connection between them. And, you know, uh, uh, Jessica, all over the world, uh, no matter what culture you go in, you run into the shapeshifters. You run into the vampires. And mm -hmm. uh, look at the boo hag. You know, I don't know if I told you about the boo hag. You ever heard of the boo hag? I have, yes. Yeah, the boo hag is a very interesting creature because it is more like a vampire. Uh, than it, than anything else, but it's kind of like the skinwalker. In other words, the boo hag will will kill you, steal your skin, wear it, and fool somebody else to keep the chain going. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the interesting aspect of it. Sort of like a vampire type creature, and yet it's sort of like a skinwalker too. But anyway, um, the uh, the uh, vampire appears throughout all of cultures. Look at the uh, Greek vampire, the Volvalica. The Strengo, the Nosferatu, uh, it goes by many names all over the world, but it keeps popping up as time comes in. And you know, when I first, the very first thing when I first got into paranormal stuff many, 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 many years ago, uh, I, uh, that was the one question that struck me. Why in every culture are there giants and witches and shapeshifters and vampires and ghosts and giants? Why is this going on? Why? There's an answer to it. Somebody somewhere 
actually must have saw one of these things. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. 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 Giants are really a, a big topic right now. And people are, you know, I've seen videos of what people claim to be are giants walking on top of mountains and things like that. And, uh, you know, I, I actually did a show on the giant of Kandahar and that was, yeah. that was really interesting. Uh, and you know, we've got all these giants in the cave, all these giant skeletons that have been found all over the United States and in caves like Lovelock cave. Um, and there's a concerted effort to cover all this up. And, uh, and so that's why we were talking about that on the show last week. Um, with Jesus Pian, uh, it was really, when you see pictures of, what is claimed to be the Tartarian Empire, they have giant humans walking amongst the normal size folks. Okay. Uh, and it was pretty commonplace. Like where, where did all that go? Where did they go? Well, I think if you were, if you were going to hide and really be good at hiding, you would go underground or under the ocean or the lakes. Those would be the perfect places to hide. Uh, I think that's why so many times Bigfoot and Dogman and all these other things are associated with cave systems. And supposedly, the whole world is honeycombed with cave systems. You could possibly go from one continent to another just about underground if mm -hmm. you did it the right way. Uh, we don't know what's under there, Jessica. That's a whole another ball of wax there. In other words, that, that's a vast, unexplored area. We have no idea what is beneath our feet or beneath our ocean. Or, or lakes and stuff. Yeah. Um, that's a big possibility of things there. Um, yeah. I have talked many times about the supposed uh, underground civilizations that may exist, uh, where some of these so-called flying saucers actually come from. That's another possibility. You know? Yeah, that's something else. that I'll, I'll be talking about that on Friday, actually. I have remote viewed the high Brazil. Okay. For anyone who's interested in high Brazil, it's a phantom Island off the coast of Ireland. Dennis, this thing pops up every seven years or it used to, I don't know if it's been around in a while, but um, it may have some ties to inner earth. You know, that's what some people say. I'm, I'm not going to give it away. Uh, you'll have to watch the show on Friday, but um, there's a lot of inner earth stuff going on down there. I mean, I think there's a whole other uh, world down there. There's a lot, of, a lot of ties to that. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, all look at all of our superstitions and folklore about, you know, where did the fairies live? Underground. You know, the leprechauns, they were underground. Yeah. Uh, a lot of stuff is, you know, attributed to that area underground. What's going on with that? You know? Yeah. Alicia, thank you so much for that super sticker. You are so sweet. I do appreciate it. Um, now, uh, let's see. Oh, Alicia also wanted to let you know that she loves your accent when you say Charleston. Okay. So every, <laughs> that's my southern accent, southern accent, Charleston. Yeah. Yeah. I say, that's a beautiful city. I'd like to lead some ghost tours down there sometimes. It's very oh. interesting. You know, man, let um, us know. We'll, we'll, we'll all sign oh, up. Make a weekend. I of spent it. one night, uh, I spent one night in Rope Makers Lane. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's a no. supposed haunted alley where you can see the, the spirit of the shadow of a, of a ghost pirate actually oh. uh, on the wall where it was murdered. At. I didn't get to see it though, but unfortunately it was a very creepy place though. <laughs> yeah. That sounds, that sounds pretty cool. It's right up my alley. Uh, Dennis, yeah. have you ever encountered any witches? I bet you. Oh, have. Yes. Yeah. I had a, uh, I had a, uh, a warlock tell me one time and he said, I can curse you to death. I said, you mind could, but I'm still here. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> I, run into, I, run into a, I run into a few in my time. Yeah. You're just too high vibe. Your, your vibration is too high for anything to touch you. Eddie yeah. Petch, thank you so much for that super sticker, super, super chat. What well, uh, the, <laughs> the, thank you. the interesting thing about the witches and stuff like that, uh, uh, most of the time, they don't want you to know they're witches. Those are the ones that are the most dangerous. They're oh, the ones yeah. that hide what they truly are uh, yes. so that they can do what they want to do. And that's not usually good things that they want to do. Okay. So can I tell you something? I don't know why. I was thinking about this today when I was getting <laughs> dressed. There are, you know, I don't know why this came to me today. But, you know, when you go to like a potluck. When, when you're going to a big dinner and every little old lady and young lady and man probably too, the, everybody makes a dish, okay? How safe is it for you to eat that food 
Okay, because knowing what you know, Dennis, and knowing that people do put curses on food and uh, and and put body fluids in casseroles and God knows what, I don't know if I want to go to any kind of function, even a buffet, <laughs> to eat anymore. I've I've been That's learning nice. a little too much about this lately. I have heard that. You know, I'm gonna tell you yeah. something. One of the main ingredients of black witchcraft, uh, like the voodoo ceremonies and to do with the voodoo dolls. You had to have a piece of that person, Their hair. Uh, you know, like a hair or fingernail you know, clippings or something, or even a claw of clothing that that person wore uh, in order to facilitate your spell or your hex or whatever you want to call it. Well, mm -hmm. also, there's a reverse to that. Yeah, the old voodoo does. I have one here in the office somewhere. It, it doesn't look like you, and no, I don't have pins in it, okay? <laughs> I hope it's not. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, uh, it's just for it's just for teaching purposes only. Right. Anyway, uh, sure it is. Uh, <laughs> there's another reverse to that. If you put yourself into something like uh, like people used to spit in food and do stuff like that, you know, gross stuff like that, it is sort of a curse. Mm -hmm. It is sort of it's like the evil eye. Kind of, you know, you're familiar with the evil eye. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, you remember this song, mm -hmm. get rid of the evil eyes to do this thing. Uh, but um, it is sort of like wishing bad things on that person. That's mm -hmm. what it basically is, uh, whether it be germs or what. But I'm just saying, you're wishing something bad, you're wishing something bad for that person. Uh, a lot of these people, they do that. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in order to have power over other people, that's what right. it basically comes down to. That's what all dark magic is. The want or need for power. It's where they hook up that power from. Where do they plug in their little, their little core to that power, you know? And that power that they're hooking up to eventually will destroy them. Evil falls eventually on its own sword. Yes. Good always wins. Eventually, it may take a while. It may yeah. take a long time, yeah. but it'll yeah. end. But that is the very yeah. nature, Jessica. The very nature of evil is self-destruction. It it will destroy yeah. you, and it will destroy itself in the process. That's just what it is. It's all about destroying. That's the negative thing. The good, positive thing is about creation. You know, when people are express themselves artistically. They're putting themselves into that art. That's what I'm saying about the people putting stuff in food and all that. Stuff. When you put yourself into something, that's part of your creation, you know, and that is sort of like a, a spiritual or psychic link to it because that's part of you in yeah. that, you know. I've often said that as a writer, when you write a story and you put it out, it's like having a child. You put that child out in the world. You mm -hmm. still love it, but you say, okay, go out and and be somebody, okay? Uh, that's just the way you do your children, you know, and and you have that connection, not only because your children are part of you and you yeah. are part of them, but yeah. that's part of the creation, you know? Tony, you have a great point. This is my friend, Tony, okay? He said, just bless your food. That's why we say a prayer over our food before we eat. And yeah. That's another way to turn it back, to turn that mm -hmm. evil back, you know? Uh, yeah. There used to be, uh, I can't remember the incantation now, it was sort of like an invocation. It would say, whatever evil you have sent forth, I send it back to you tenfold. Yeah. And I think that's from the Bible, actually. I send it back to you tenfold. So that's the way to do it. Then send it back. Say, I don't want it. Send it back. Don't let it give it to me. I don't want it. If you accept it, I'm going to tell you what. If I walk up and gave you a uh, coochie bag, Gucci bag. I'll be. And, and, okay. And, and you took it, then what? It belongs to you. Mm -hmm. Once you take something, I don't care what it is, be very careful what you take from people, okay? But once you take it, it's yours. I'm sorry. That's it. It's yours. The, the, the powers that be in the universe recognize it. It belongs to Jessica now. You know? oh. That's it. And it's, and, and but So be very careful what you take. Of course, I, I get one of those thing. bags. I'll definitely give it to you. I don't want nothing from nobody. <laughs> yeah. uh, be careful, you know. You know, you know. I don't know if, mo if mother ever told you to be not to take gifts from strangers. Remember that? Yeah. There's a reason why Mama told you that. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. There's a reason. Yeah. You never know. Well, now we got Halloween coming up, Dennis. So all the kids are going to be out 
getting candy. And my son brought that up the other night. He said, well, mom, we're not supposed to take things from strangers, especially not candy. But yet you take me trick or treating <laughs> is what he told yeah. me. So just got to check the Reese's Buttercups, son. That's well, all I got to do. <laughs> there you go. I don't need them myself. But anyway. They're not poison. <laughs> That's a thing about Halloween. Somebody asked me, I said, how do you feel about Halloween? I said, well, it's sort of a two-edged knife. You know, it cuts both ways. I like it because yeah. it's fun for kids, but it also is a very evil night. A lot of evil is done on Halloween night. It's not a very good night in that aspect, although it is for little kids in their imagination. I, I can go along with that and the candy and all that. But on the other side, there is a dark side. You know, I, I actually did a show one time on the dark side of Christmas. You might want to think about that sometime. The dark mm -hmm. side of Christmas. There is a dark side. Well, Everything has a good yeah. and dark side. Yeah. That's right. It's um, the, the dark and the light, right? It's kind of the yin and the yang. Yeah. Dennis, what do you think about mental illness and possession? Primal Cry would like to know. Well, uh, a lot. And that's this is where it gets really really shaky ground here where does real mental illness and possession begin and end uh what is real i have known that these demonic forces will use mental illness it's like I, I said earlier about your weakest points they will use mental illness to do what they want to do and hide behind it but you've got to be very careful with that that's why so many uh, men of the cloth no longer want to do exorcisms because you don't, they don't know that you've got to be a psychiatrist, you've got to be a, uh, a physician, you've got to be many things in order to help these people spiritually, if that, if it truly is a spiritual sickness. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and that ties in also to the addictions and things like that. I mean, those are, those can oh, yeah. be considered an illness there, as well. But there again, you have, you have demons that, that foster uh, addictions. Um, so you've got to be very careful what you're dealing with, and you've got to look for the demonic signs. Uh, I put that out in my other book, uh, uh, Beyond the Shadows. I had people come up, tell me what, tell me what to look for. I said, well, I'll give you a list of a few things. Uh, mm -hmm. and these are things that maybe, maybe, you know, it's not always that, you know, it's not cut and dry that way. You've got to be all, uh, very very careful what you're diagnosing and what you're really looking at to make sure what it really is. You know, when I go to interview people and they have demonic problems, I have to ask them a lot of personal questions because these things go over into the personal aspect of things, even their sex lives and, and their, their family lives and all these things, because that's the way these things work. They work on every facet of your life. Yeah. They chip, they'll chip away at you too. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Donald's talking about the late Lanier having the towns underneath them. Uh, that's just something that a lot of a lot of these lakes all over were made. Horrible, horrible lake the at the town beneath it. Yeah. Horrible yeah. lake at the town beneath it. I've seen pictures of it. Uh, although I don't die, I've seen pictures of it. And it makes you wonder if uh, in those cemeteries are there. It's just like the town is just covered in water. Uh mm. It makes you wonder if there's some unfinished business under those lakes, you know? Yeah, I agree. I wow. agree. Well, Dennis, I'm not going to keep you here all day. This has been an amazing show today. And uh, we've gone about an hour and a half. I mean, we, we can keep going if you'd uh, like, but um, or we can save it because you're coming on Spaced Out Radio uh, in a couple of weeks. You are going to be my Halloween special guest uh, uh, there. So w give us a little preview of what we'll be talking about at Spaced Out Radio. Uh, we're going to get into some very, very dark stuff. Yes. Uh, we're going to talk about <laughs> professional grave robbers. Yes, they still exist. Yeah. Uh, we're going to follow the money on that. And we're going to talk about, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about my uh, other experience with voodoo, where I actually saw a voodoo ceremony. Okay. Uh, a real one, not the tourist type. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to get deeper into some other things that are very, very dark, like demonic reanimation of the dead stuff oh. like that some fun fun stuff like that that sounds like a barrel of monkeys that sounds so fun yeah. <laughs> it does sound fun though and uh, and it's yeah. and you are such a wealth of knowledge now dennis you and william nighthawk have the coolest show every saturday and sunday morning tell me a little bit about that so and tell everybody where they can find y'all 
you know, we call that the uh, paranormal morning brew. That's yeah. what we sit around in uh, with our uh, cups of coffee. I, I, and, I uh, yeah. And, yeah, we discuss everything uh, pertaining to the paranormal from uh, conspiracy theories to portals and all that good stuff in between. Uh, Bigfoot, Dogman, all the, all the main topics. And then we get in some really, really out there stuff, too. Oh, it's fun. And you're very interactive with your chat room, too. So if anybody has a question, you and William cover all the questions and, and really are um, just yeah, really are pretty uh, interactive. If anyone has any uh, pressing questions or anything that they want to ask me, uh, they can uh, get in touch with me at Ghost Wolf DC. Like in Washington, D.C., that's one word, ghostwolfdc at gmail.com. I'll put it up and on the my, And that's my, uh, my website. You can also get in touch with me through it as well. Yeah, that's your website, denniswcarroll.com. Um, and we have Ghost Wolf. Ghost Is that Wolf right, Dennis? DC. Okay. Ghost Wolf DC at gmail. That's my Indian name, by the way. I was oh, given that name by uh, Indian, uh, a uh, Native American friend of mine many years ago, Ghost Wolf, because I walk between the worlds. Uh, I don't <laughs> often do that, though. <laughs> but I always thought it was cool. That's awesome. I like it. I, it suits you. I like that. I yeah. like that. And we, we were able to talk about a lot of wolves today and uh, werewolves yeah. and vampires. This has been awesome, Dennis. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, oh, anytime. You're just, uh, you're just invaluable, like just wealth of knowledge. Okay. And, uh, yeah. and I hope you'll come back and join me again. I know you're coming on well, Space radio, but uh, I'd, I'd like for you to come back here sometime too on a daytime show. Maybe you yeah. and William can come in here together one day and, uh, and we, and we can all, right. uh, all three sit around and talk about some good that stuff. That sounds good. All right. Well, everybody, thank y'all for joining us today. This has been an amazing show. Um, I just wanted to get in that Halloween spirit today. Okay. Uh, we're getting okay. the countdowns on to Halloween. Uh, so y'all make sure you lock your doors and bring your pets inside on Halloween. Okay. <laughs> Cause it could get dicey out there, but, um, but yeah, you guys join me on Friday night. I'll be uh, talking about high Brazil with Barry Littleton. Uh, I've remote viewed that. And then this weekend, Let's see, who all do I have coming on my show? I have Matt Williamson will be here on Saturday and have Tom Springer, or no, on Sunday, Tom Springer uh, will be here, uh, there, here. I'm going to be sitting right here, but it's going to be on Space Out Radio. Tom Springer on Saturday. So you guys have a wonderful day. Thank y'all so much for being here. And, uh, and we will see you next time. Y'all have a great day. All right, let's see if I can find my button. Bye, y'all. Mm -hmm.